everyone, Lara here from Theatre of Science. Welcome to my third interactive online science lesson. Today we are learning about amazing animals. There's a list in the description here if you'd like to do the experiments along with me, or just watch, have fun, and you can do them yourselves later if you like. Right. So first, Animals that survive in freezing cold waters. Now, before we learn about these guys, we have to play a game called fish or mammal. So I'm a physics teacher. I had to research this a little bit. Mammals breathe through lungs and have warm blood. So they need to keep warm or they die. Uh, fish breathe through gills and they are cold blooded, which means they adapt their temperature to their surroundings. So if the water is warm, a fish is warm. If the water is cold, a fish is cold. So. Mammals breathe through lungs, warm blood. Fish breathe through gills, cold blood. So I'm going to show you some things. Uh, count to three, and I just want you to say if it's a fish or if it's a mammal. <clears throat> Tiger, fish or mammal? Three, two, one. It is a mammal. Tigers have fur to keep them warm. They get harder. Um, goldfish, fish or mammal? Three, two, one. Yeah, it's a fish. Well done. Seal. Three, two, one. It's a mammal. Uh, ah, next one. Dolphin. Fish or mammal? Three, two, one. They are mammals. Oh, I told you it was getting harder. Right. Sharks. Fish or mammal? Three, two, one. Fish. Shark is a fish. And. Whales. What's a whale? Fish or mammal? Three, two, one. Mammal. And narwhals. Also mammals. Uh, last one. Penguins. Fish or mammal? Three, two, one. It's a bird. <laughs> Did I catch you out? Better caught some adults out there. It's not easy. It's, it's not easy, this biology malarkey. Uh, starfish. Not a fish. You can look that up later. So, whales. Seals. Mammals, just like us, they've got warm blood, but they can swim in Antarctic waters. How do they do that? If we jumped into the Antarctic Sea, we would be dead in five minutes. Um, I'm going to do a little experiment, which you can do alongside me, if you've got a teaspoon of butter and two ice cubes. It could be butter, lard, uh, shortening, anything like that. What I'm going to do is put the teaspoon of butter into the palm of one of my hands. There we go and uh, make a little, try and put a little dent in it so it's sort of like a cup. I'm going to rest an ice cube on top of it in a minute. So it's a dead simple experiment. All I'm going to do is put an ice cube on top of my little butter cup um, and an ice cube on top of this palm. And the idea is that you, uh, you just wait and see how long it takes for you to feel so uncomfortable that you have to drop one of the ice cubes. Um, now, you probably, if you're doing this, you'll notice straight away that the normal hand feels a lot colder. The butter hand, don't be a hero. As soon as you need to drop an ice cube because it's just too painful, drop the ice cube. So the idea here is that uh, what we're learning is that mammals, marine mammals like whales and seals are covered with a very thick uh, fat-like layer just under their skin and it's called blubber. And bl oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. Blubber is absolutely amazing. I mean, I, could, I feel like I could do this all day um, because that ice cube was stealing heat energy from my hand, whereas this ice cube I can't really get to my hand because this butter an insulator uh, isn't allowing it to steal the heat from my hand. So this is what whales and seals do. Um, they're covered just under their skin with a thick layer of blubber. It's amazing stuff. It's uh, It's got blood vessels in it which get smaller, which can keep them warm. Um, it stores energy just like our fat does and uh, it floats, which is handy isn't it if you live in the sea. It's basically like having a massive rubber ring inside your body all over. Uh, well done marine mammals. Now keep the butter on your hand please. You can let go of the ice cube. Keep the butter on your hand because we're going to look at how geckos stick to ceilings. If you've never seen a gecko, very cute little lizards, big eyes. And uh, if you go to a warm country, if you're lucky, even in your hotel room, you might see them just walking up the wall and then just standing on the ceiling. Like, no big deal. 
So I'd like you to get some scrap paper and <laughs> rub the butter in between your palms like this. Oh, yeah. Mmm, science feels lovely. There we go. And then um, press your hands down as flat as you can onto the paper. If you haven't done the experiment, um, just try pressing your hands down really flat onto a table now, or a book, or any hard object that's around you. And then peel your hands off, and now you can wipe your hands. Uh, uh, I forgot. You should just use soap and water or something more eco-friendly. Yeah. Feels quite nice, actually. Right, you probably noticed that you can't get your hands right flat against the table. Um, if you look at your handprint, you might see that there's, there's some little holes around your palms and some gaps in between your fingers. Um, now put your hands on your back or on a carpet or a sofa, anything soft. And you should notice that you can feel a little bit more of your hand is pressed against the surface. Now imagine that that soft surface has lots and lots of teeny tiny little hairs which are getting into all the gaps and the cracks in your hands. Now imagine that those teeny tiny little hairs have even teeny tiny little hairs which are getting right into the gaps between the particles that your hands are made of. Now this is how geckos walk on walls. Um, it turns out, we talk a lot about this in our lessons, everything in the world is made of particles. And when these particles touch each other, uh, they become a little bit attracted to each other. They get a little bit sticky. Um, so the gecko has such fine hairs on its hands that the particles of its hands get so close to the particles on the ceiling that it sticks. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Lara, I can hear you saying, can we do another experiment to investigate this weird particle stickiness you're talking about? Yes, we can. Let's get a bowl of water and um, any kind of powder. Black pepper works best, I hear, but I'm using ground allspice because I don't know what else it's for. Just put a very thin layer of whatever powder stuff you've got on top of the water. Just quite a thin layer, okay? Here we go, I'll show you what I've done. Stick your finger in, give it a swirl. Notice that not very much happens. Why is the powder floating on top of the water? Well, water particles are particularly attracted to each other and the water particles on the surface don't have any particles to stick to above them. So they're, they're clinging really tightly to the water particles next to them, which is what's creating this, uh, this sort of tense layer. We call it water surface tension. And uh, that's what is causing the powder to float on top of the water. Now, get some fairy liquid and we'll stick our finger in again and see what happens. Creatures like uh, pond skaters, in the US they call them water striders. Uh, these animals have evolved to be able to balance on water just like this powder's doing. And uh, if after this lesson's finished you Google the unsinkable pygmy gecko, you'll find an amazing clip uh, from a David Attenborough documentary showing a lizard that can walk on water. Anyway, here is my washing up liquid finger and let's see what happens when I put that in. <gasps> wow, look at that. So what's happening? The washing up liquid has broken the bonds of the water particles and so the water particles are flooding to the sides of the bowl where the surface tension is still high and they're taking the powder with them. There you go. You've done a lot of thinking, so we'll do one more experiment and then it's time for story time. If you've seen my first interactive science lesson on rainbows, uh, available on my YouTube channel now, please subscribe, you will know that white light is made of all the colours of the rainbow, but there's something amazing that I didn't tell you in that lesson. There is another kind of light in the rainbow that humans can't see. How awesome is that? There's actually a lot of light, but today we're going to look at just above the red there's another light called infrared radiation which is invisible to us but certain snakes like boa constrictors uh, vampire bats mosquitoes they can see it and there's actually a very very simple but not terribly well known experiment that you can do which allows you to see it as well for this you will need a remote control a tv remote control any tv remote that works off infrared um 
and your mobile phone camera or the mobile phone camera of an obliging adult. Now humans use infrared radiation for all kinds of things but we use it for TV remote controls and infrared signal beams between the remote control and the TV. Now turn a TV remote control towards your eyes, it's not dangerous, press a button and uh, you should see nothing because it's using infrared and your eyes can't see infrared radiation. But the cameras inside mobile phones aren't quite as precise as your eyes um, and they sort of bleed a little bit either way so they can pick up infrared radiation so obviously you're on my phone camera right now so you'll be able to see this hopefully um, or if you've got a camera at home you can do it yourself there you go look at that wow so everything gives off infrared radiation um, and the hotter a thing is, the more infrared radiation it gives off. That's why if you're lying in bed and you hear a mosquito and you think, oh, maybe if I stay very quiet, it won't see me, you are out of luck because it can see in infrared. So you, you basically look like a ball of fire lying on your bed. Now, I said that after that experiment, we would do story time. I'm very excited about this one. We're hearing the story of a young girl called Jane Goodall. Now. When Jane was a little girl, she dreamed of going to Africa and studying the animals there. But her mum and dad didn't have the kind of money that could give her that sort of education. So she went to college and studied how to be a secretary. But she never forgot her dream. And when she came back from studying how to be a secretary, she got a job as a waitress, worked, worked, worked as hard as she possibly could and earned enough money finally to go to Africa. And when she was in Africa, she did a very clever thing. She looked up a top scientist who studied animals. She met up with him and he offered her a job. What job did he offer her? That's right. He asked her to be his secretary. <laughs> but he was actually secretly looking for someone to go and study chimpanzees. And Jane was so enthusiastic and so savvy that eventually... He paid for her to go to this national park and study chimpanzees. This was amazing. Jane was studying chimpanzees for a job. It was a dream come true. The problem was Jane didn't know very much about how to study animals. But the good thing was Jane didn't know very much about how to study animals. Now, if she'd been taught properly, she would have been told they don't have any personality animals no you just number them one two three four however many animals you're studying uh write all down all the results uh, and that's it really yes it's we humans who are the most amazing animals on the planet we all have personalities we can use tools it's not really worth worrying about animals very much jane but jane didn't get told that she didn't know any of that so she sat down and started watching the chimpanzees day after day week after week for six months she watched chimpanzees and she gave them all names she discovered that they all had fantastic personalities and she wrote about that and she wasn't embarrassed to write about that because she didn't know that that wasn't what anyone else believed at the time um and a month before she was due to stop studying chimpanzees she discovered two particularly amazing things everyone knew that they were vegetarians and then she saw one eating meat and the most exciting thing of all one day she saw a chimpanzee picking a branch of a tree stripping all the leaves off it sticking it into a termite nest and scooping up a load of termites with it and then eating them now it doesn't sound amazing to us but when jane wrote to the top scientist and told him that this is what she'd seen he wrote back and said well we have to think again about what tool means what chimpanzee means or what human means Jane had discovered information that would made us completely rethink what it is to be a human being. When people made TV programmes about her, they wrote books about her, she came to England to give a lecture on what she'd learned and um, she got a mixed reception. Some people wanted to talk more about what she looked like, which made her quite angry, but in the end she said that as long as people were listening to her and she was still getting money to study and help the chimpanzees, that was the most important thing. Now, if you uh, if you type Jane Goodall into the internet, you'll see that one of the questions that people ask most is, when did Jane Goodall die? 
I know Jane. I know it's a very rude question because at the time of filming, Jane Goodall is still alive. In fact, it was her birthday a couple of days ago. Happy 86th birthday, Jane Goodall. And thank you very much for showing us that human beings are definitely not the only amazing animals on the planet. Right, that was story time. The next thing I'd like to do very quickly is stand up, give your legs a shake, give your arms a shake, give your shoulders a jiggle. That's right, loosen up a bit now. What I need you to do is to put your arms like that in a straight line for me, see that? And you're going to bend your knees and I need you to just very quickly move your hands to the other side like that. And then again. Yeah, you're doing it. That's right. And then you need to lift your shoulders up at the same time. So it's like a... That's right. And then hands right in front of you and... Do that, can you see what I'm doing there? That's it, that's it, yeah. The whole body needs to get into it really. Uh, do a spin, that's it. Right. That wasn't part of the experiment, I just thought you needed a bit of a stretch. Right, Pacific salmon are born in streams, travel 3,000 kilometers. If you're in the UK, that's like from here to Russia. And then they travel all the way back again to the same stream without getting lost. How do they do that? Uh, I'm going to do a little experiment with a magnet. If you want to join in, you need a bowl of water, a magnet, any size will do. I'm just going to use this little fridge magnet and uh, a needle. Now I need to be careful for this bit. Ask an adult to help you if you're worried that you'll stab yourself. All you're going to do, watch me before you do it, is take your needle and um, just stroke it across the same bit of the magnet over and over again. But don't don't stroke it backwards and forwards, just stroke it one way and then lift it up and then stroke it again. So lift up, stroke, lift up, stroke on the same bit of the magnet every time. What are magnets? Very basically, just bits of metal with a north pole and a south pole. If you've played with magnets, you might have noticed that if you put two ends together, a north and a north or a south and a south, then they push against each other. But if you put a north pole and a south pole next to each other, uh, then they're attracted to each other. They can stick together. Now. A needle, as we know, is made of teeny tiny particles. The particles in a needle are like lots of teeny tiny little magnets and they're all facing different directions so you don't notice. But what you're doing when you stroke your needle with a magnet is you're making all the particles in the needle line up the same way north to south. So you're turning the needle into a magnet essentially. Now this is the incredibly frustrating bit. It might take you a few goes. What you need to do is hold the needle just above the surface of the water and drop it in so that it floats on the water. A tip I got was if you want to use a little leaf to balance the needle on, then that works too. You ready? <sighs> if your hand's wet, it won't work, which is why it's annoying, because you've got to take the needle out and start all over again. If you've done the uh, the powder water tension experiment, don't use that bowl of water again, because don't forget, that one hasn't got any surface tension. <sighs> if you keep failing at this, and you keep going, well done, you've got something called resilience. It is much more important than being clever or just knowing things. Perseverance is good, but uh, using a different needle is also good. If you've managed to get a needle to float, do use a little leaf if it didn't work. Just get your magnet and hold it near the needle. You won't need to touch it to, to start being able to move it around quite a lot. So give it a good move. Um, try and get it to change direction. And then take the magnet away again and see what you notice. So I'm changing the direction of the needle because it's attracted to my magnet. And then I'm letting go and... <sighs> Now, first of all, how can that needle feel that magnet? It's obviously being affected, isn't it? But I'm not touching it, so what do, what's happening there? Now, if you've seen our air lesson, uh, you might be thinking it's something to do with air. That's good thinking, but it's not. This would happen on the moon. Um, the magnet is complicated and brilliant, but we won't go into it in too much detail. The magnet is giving off what's called a magnetic field, and the needle is feeling the magnetic field. When I let go, what's happening? Have you noticed that the needle's going back to pointing in the same direction every time. That's because the needle is being attracted to something else, something that isn't my magnet. What else is it being attracted to? If 
you don't know this, it's mind blowing. It's being attracted to the earth. The earth is a magnet. Did you know that? Did you know that the earth is a magnet? Ah, North Pole, South Pole. Not quite in the same place, uh, the geographic and the magnetic North and South Pole, but pretty close. The earth is a magnet. It's full of iron, which is churning around and generating these enormous magnetic fields. Um, and this is what salmon use to find their way around. Pigeons use it as well. Um, bees can sense a very similar field. You'll notice that the lines are close together in different places. That means that the magnetic field is stronger, so it's weaker over here. The magnetic field constantly changes direction. Uh, pigeons and salmon, they can sense these changes in the Earth's magnetic field and it helps them know where they're going. Now, we don't really know how they're doing that. It's quite easy to study how animals hear and see because we know where their ears are and where their eyes are. We don't know where the Thing is inside an animal that helps it sense the Earth's magnetic fields. It might be something invisible deep inside them. If you're thinking about being a scientist, that would be a very cool thing for you to study. Okay, two more demonstrations about two more different animals and then we're going to round off with our poo and wee section. Uh, okay, I hope this works. I'm going to make a noise now off camera with my hands and I want you to try and copy it. Uh, I want you to think about how I'm making the noise and copy it. Okay, ready? Did you manage to copy the noise I was making? Now, I told you I was making it with my hands. You probably knew that I wasn't clapping. That's the obvious one, but it didn't sound like clapping, did it? In fact, I was squelching my hands together uh, to release air. Now there is a shrimp, the pistol shrimp, that also makes a noise and for years and years scientists thought that it was just smacking its claws together to make this noise and then another scientist who knew a lot about bubbles said uh, no 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 that's not what it is and he was right. In fact the pistol shrimp moves its claws in such a way that creates a bubble that when it pops releases so much energy it is so loud that it can kill fish. Imagine that, imagine making a noise so loud that animals near you die. And not only that, it's got so much energy that for a very, very, very short amount of time, uh, the bubble, when it pops, is as hot as the sun. And it's a, shri it's a shrimp, it's just a little shrimp, and it just moves its claw, and poof, hotter than the sun, fish, dead. Unbelievable. Uh, the tree frog can freeze its blood. Um, frogs, just like us, all our bodies are made up of cells. Uh, our cells are full of water. If you froze a human being, the results would not be pretty. Celery, unfrozen. Celery, having been frozen and then thawed out. That's what our bodies would look like, probably. Uh, the frog, when it starts to get cold, it pumps its cells full of sugar so it can just freeze. Absolutely rock solid. Like, you can drop it it just bounces, clinks off the ground. Um, but scientists have taken it into laboratories and watched it defrost and then just hop away again. Animals are amazing. Now that is the end of all the different animals that we're going to learn about today. But I had to do a lot of research for this lesson because I am a physics teacher, which means I study things like springs and electricity and space. I did not know a lot about animals. And my research presented me with a lot of facts about Poo and Wee. So I've put them all together in this segment for you. So here we are, my four best Poo and Wee facts. Fact number one. Jaundice is a very unpleasant illness which affects the surface tension of your wee. Uh, so the test that you do to know if you've got jaundice, this is absolutely true, you sprinkle some powder into your wee and if it floats you're fine and if it sinks you've got jaundice. Fact number two, for about 5,000 years there have been about 500 penguins living on the Antarctic island of Danko. It started out as just ice and now there is almost land on this island just because of penguin poo. These penguins have done so much poo that soon plants will be able to grow on the island. Fact number three, sea cucumbers, when threatened, uh, poo out their insides and then grow more. And fact number four, dogs poo along magnetic field lines. Dogs line themselves up with the magnetic field of the Earth 
to do their poos. Uh, if you have a dog or you ever see a dog poo, I want you to immediately get the person you're with to get out any kind of map app on their phone and check whether this is true. But I don't tell you anything without checking my sources. I'm 100% certain um, that dogs poo along magnetic field lines. They've got to be relaxed, but as, as soon as they're relaxed, then... And I have to end the lesson there uh, because this is as good as any lesson could ever get. I can't better that information. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. It's incredibly useful when people do that. Um, check out my Facebook page, Theatre of Science, for more information on what I do. And uh, look out for a new lesson every week. Thanks very much. Bye.